I'm going to provide one way that we can visualize something known as the tragedy of the commons. In a previous lesson you learned about what the tragedy of the commons is. This is a market failure that arises from the over exploitation of common access resources. Common access resources as you learned in a previous lesson are those over which no individual or country has ownership but anyone can use. Some examples of common access resources discussed in the previous lesson were fisheries, forests, the atmosphere. Some other examples could include fertile soil, minerals trapped in the ground, fossil fuels, and so on. Many of these resources are not owned by any individual. They're not even clearly owned by a particular country since they lie in international waters or they are a global resource that it is simply impossible to assign ownership over. So in a previous lesson I showed how the use of these resources creates negative externalities of production or consumption resulting in a loss of total welfare in society as a whole since the resources are used in an unsustainable manner. In this lesson I want to provide one other way to visualize the market failure of the tragedy of the commons. We're going to do that using a supply and demand diagram. So for the sake of this lesson, I want to look at the market for fish, specifically open ocean fish, such as tuna, for example. Any other species of open ocean fish could be used to show the same situation, or even resources such as virgin forest in the Amazon, or farmland in a less developed country where the population is growing and the use of land is expanded in order to meet the needs of the growing population. Let's assume that decades ago, the supply of tuna in the open ocean was very high. And it was also perfectly inelastic. This means that there was only a certain number of fish in the ocean at any given time. And the quantity supplied of fish did not respond to a change in the price of fish. This is a natural resource. It's not something that is produced in a factory by firms. Whereas the supply of a particular manufactured good might be upward sloping, showing that firms are willing and able to produce a greater quantity of that good at higher prices, Mother Nature does not respond to the price signal. So there's no upward sloping supply curve of fish in the open ocean. It is perfectly inelastic, and we're assuming that S1 in this case is at a much higher level than the total supply needed to meet the entire demand of the world. So I'm going to show a demand curve, which is downward sloping. And this represents, of course, the marginal benefits of the consumers of tuna. The lower the price of tuna, the greater the quantity of tuna that would be demanded by people in society. And we're going to assume that due to the abundance of tuna in our original scenario here, they can be acquired at a very, very low marginal private cost. And in fact, the cost of an additional tuna at any given time is actually zero. So we know that the price in a world of abundance is practically zero. Tuna can be gotten very cheaply from the ocean at zero marginal cost. So what we see is that at a price of zero, the quantity of tuna demanded, we'll call it QD, which is where the demand curve crosses the quantity axis, is much less than the quantity supplied by nature. So we can say that the difference between the quantity supplied and the quantity demanded in this case is, in a way, surplus tuna representing an abundance of this natural resource. Society is not yet facing scarcity in its consumption of tuna. But what happens as populations grow? Let's show a scenario here where decades go by, demand grows as the demand for protein to feed the growing world population increases. So we will see the demand for tuna eventually shift outwards. Call this demand curve D1. This might be decades later, maybe a century later. Demand has grown due to growing populations. So we can say here that the determinant of demand here is the number of consumers. So as the population grows, there is increasing demand for all sorts of food, including seafood, which is caught in the open ocean. But what starts to happen to the supply of tuna available in the ocean? As fishermen meet the growing demand of tuna, the supply will eventually start to decrease because 
naturally, tuna are being fished, they are being caught. So I can call this new supply, S2. And let's look at what happens. If the price of tuna remains at zero, in other words, if people continue to treat this resource as if it is in abundance, it is not becoming scarce, then the quantity demanded at the new level of demand will be QD1, but the quantity supplied by nature will be QS1. And what we have now is not abundance. We have no more surpluses of tuna. What we end up with instead is shortages. And rather than facing abundance in this natural resource, society is now facing scarcity. A resource that was once relatively abundant is now becoming relatively scarce. Let's continue this logic. What happens if demand continues to grow due to growing populations? The demand curve will continue to shift out. That will be at D2. And not surprisingly, supply will continue to decrease due to the continued extraction of the resource from the sea. So what's happening here? Unless there is an efficient way to price this natural resource, we'll assume that the price remains at zero. People still treat this resource as if it is in relative abundance. And people will still consume the resource based on their private benefits of consumption. So the quantity demanded will now be Q3, but the quantity supplied will have decreased to QS3. As you can see, the world is facing increasing scarcity of this diminishing natural resource. The shortage of available tuna is growing and scarcity has intensified. In the scenario illustrated by S3 and D2, the world is facing a tragedy of the commons. Without an efficient pricing mechanism, if the price of this natural resource remains at zero, the quantity demanded will far outstrip the quantity supplied. So what does a shortage of a resource like tuna or seafood really represent? What we're seeing here is a loss of total welfare in society. Resources are over allocated towards this renewable resource due to overfishing in this case. So what's the solution to this market failure? Clearly what is needed is an efficient pricing mechanism. Notice that at the original level of demand and supply, that was D and S1, there was an equilibrium price of zero. So in fact, zero was just fine. A price of zero was just fine at the original level of demand and supply because there was abundance of tuna available. But as demand grew to D1 and supply decreased to S2, what should have happened was the price of tuna should have started to rise. There should have been an increasing cost of extracting tuna to the fishermen who are actually catching the fish. But what happens instead is that if the price remains at zero, we end up with the shortage of tuna that I illustrated previously. As demand continues to rise to D2 and supply continues to fall to S3, what should happen is the price should be increasing for this now increasingly scarce natural resource. So this could be considered PE3. But in the absence of a price mechanism, if prices remain at zero, then the quantity demanded will far outstrip the quantity supplied. So what we see here is that in the absence of a pricing system that assigns an appropriate price to the natural resource, it will be over exploited by the free market. And this scenario could be played out in many different markets. It's not only fish in the open ocean. Any natural resources over which there is no clear ownership tend to be underpriced by the free market. The cost of extracting these natural resources is much lower to those that actually engage in its extraction than it is to society as a whole. We end up with the market failure arising from the overproduction and overconsumption of renewable or non-renewable natural resources. What's a possible solution to this? What can be done to prevent the overconsumption and overproduction of non-renewable and renewable natural resources? Clearly, government or some international organization needs to figure out how to assign efficient prices to these resources. There needs to be some way to impose on the producers of these goods or the extractors of these goods a private cost that more accurately reflects the social costs of the goods consumption and production.
some ways that policymakers have responded to the diminishing supply of renewable and non-renewable natural resources is through things such as corrective taxes and tradable permits or quotas on extraction or simply limits or bans. Each of these responses has its merits and some of them have some disadvantages as well but each of them in some way imposes on the producers and extractors of natural resources some increased cost that more accurately internalizes the cost of the goods extraction from the environment. So even something like fish, it's not to say that fish cannot be extracted from the ocean at all if we want to have healthy fish stocks. There is some level of extraction that is socially optimal. In our graph here, QS3 and QS1, and QS all represent efficient levels of extraction of tuna from the ocean. However, the problem is that under the free market, in which there is no way to impose a price on these goods that reflects that socially optimal level, we end up with greater levels of extraction of the resource. So an efficient way to price renewable and non-renewable natural resources will result in a more socially optimal level of extraction and consumption. In the absence of this, though, we will experience the tragedy of the commons, in which non-renewable or renewable resources are consumed at a quantity that exceeds the sustainable and socially optimal level. Here we go. One step back.